right. Good morning, church. I'm excited to kick off this new series called The Blueprint for Biblical Leadership. Over the next three weeks, we're going to examine what godly leadership looks like, as well as the biblical framework for leadership within the church. And we're going to talk about how our church is organized and functions. Today, we're going to start by looking at what godly leadership looks like because we are all called in some form or fashion to be leaders in our homes, in our communities, in our schools. And so we're going to look at what godly leadership looks like today. Now, I'm not much of a football fan, but I came across a quote by Vince Lombardi, and I think it rings true here today. He said this, leaders are made, they are not born. They're made by hard effort, which is the price which all of us pay, must pay to achieve any goal that is worthwhile. And I think he's right. Leaders are not born, they are made. If you look at Moses, he was a murderer with a speech impediment. And he led the nation of Israel outside or out of Egypt to the edge of the promised land. Paul, whom we've been talking about for the last six weeks as we studied his letter to the Romans, was responsible for the murder of many Christians. But God still used him to plant churches and advance the gospel to Gentiles like you and me. And if you look at these leaders you will see flawed humans whom God chose to use as leaders among his people. And God is the one who chooses the leaders of his church. We, the born-again believers, are called to pray and hope and search for godly leaders to lead this church. We need godly leadership to take us where God wants us to go. And there are three general traits of a godly leader found in, of all places, Philippians 1.1. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open to Philippians, which is in the New Testament. It's near the back half of your Bible. And Philippians 1.1 is part of Paul's introduction to the church in Philippi. But we're going to spend some time here with this one verse, the first half of this message, looking at three godly character traits, or godly leadership traits. It says this in Philippians 1.1, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all of the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. A godly leader must see themselves as a slave to Christ. Now this word that we have translated here as servants is actually the Greek word doulos. And it's better rendered as slave. In almost every modern English translation, except for, oddly enough, the New Living Translation, this word is translated as servant. And I assume that's probably because they're trying to soften the language a little. The word slave brings up for us here in America images of our country's dark history. No one wants to be thought of as a slave. Why? Well, because servants choose the work they do. They're compensated for their efforts. A servant is free to choose whom they will serve. Slaves, on the other hand, slaves have no choice. Slaves are owned. They have been purchased at a price. Slaves are entirely dependent on their master. And as born-again believers, we have to understand that we are slaves to Christ. We are chosen. Ephesians 1.4 says, He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him we were purchased first corinthians 6 19 through 20 says or do you not know that your body is a temple of the holy spirit within you whom you have from god you are not your own for you were bought with a price 
So glorify God in your body. As a slave, we are entirely dependent on the master. James 1.17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with, with whom there is no variation due to change. See, all that I am, all that I will ever be, is because of Christ. And don't get me wrong, I, I have a long way to go. I've been a believer for more than 20 years, but I have a lot of room to grow as I mature in Christ. And the leaders of this church, we have a long way to go as we continue to grow and mature in Christ. There is a ton of room for improvement. But this is the crisis we face in the Western church today. See, we need leaders who are slaves to Christ. We need leaders in our churches who are focused on making Christianity clear, not cool. We need leaders who don't create churches that depend solely on their leadership, but leaders who create a church culture where people are fully, completely, and without reservation dependent on God for everything in every area, in every situation of their life. And if we're going to be a church that changes the communities that we serve, if we're going to be a church that transforms Montgomery and Warren and Gasconade and Callaway County and beyond, if we're going to be a church that shakes the gates of hell, then we've got to be a group of born-again believers that Satan trembles at. And it starts with a group of leaders who are dependent on Christ as a slave depends on their master. Jeremiah 2, 12 through 13 shows us what happens when we don't have leaders like this. He says this, Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked, be utterly desolate, declares the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they've hewn out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. See, when leaders forsake God for fame or power or influence, if they do not depend on God physically and spiritually and emotionally, then they will end up leading the people to empty cisterns that have no life. The second trait of a godly leader is this. A godly leader must see the church as God sees the church. Look back at Philippians 1, 1 again. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. Paul wrote to all the saints. He didn't write to just some of the saints. He didn't write to the powerful saints. He didn't write to the power player saints, the wealthy saints, not just the saints who had influence or the well-to-do saints. No, Paul says to all the saints in Christ Jesus. And that's because Galatians 3.28 says there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, but you are all one in Christ Jesus. See, we all have an equal footing at the cross of Christ. We are different, yes. We have different backgrounds, different races, different financial obligation, and different financial resources even. And we should celebrate that because that diversity from God is a beautiful thing. But as we discussed last week, if you are born again, you are a saint in Christ. The Greek word for saint is hagios, and it means to be set apart by and for God. In 1 Peter 2, 9-10, through 10, it says this, You are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, now you are God's people. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. See, we as born-again believers, we are set apart to proclaim the gospel, and as church leaders, it is essential that we see the church as a collective of saints who are called together in this place, in this season, at this time, to proclaim the gospel to this community that we serve that desperately needs the light. And how do you become a saint? 
Well, Romans 10, 9 tells us who is a saint, who is set apart. It says this, for if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Finally, Philippians 1, 1 shows us a godly leader must equip and empower others to lead. Philippians 1.1 says this, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. See, when Paul came to Philippi, he equipped and empowered the local saints that were there to lead the church they were leading as overseers and deacons. These are the two ordained offices within the governing organizational structure of a local church. And there are many leadership roles within a church, such as pastors and staff members, but there are only two offices, elders and deacons. And when you came today, you should have received this booklet titled, The Blueprint for Biblical Leadership, Elders at High Hill Christian Church. We've spent the last six months, the elders have spent studying God's Word to identify and clarify the biblical leaders that serve this church. So if you have this book, I want you to take it out and I want you to flip it over to this side. And you'll find a QR code. And this is a somewhat risky thing to do. But what we want you to do is scan this QR code. If you're watching online, it's also, the link is also in the Church Center app. We want you to spend some time this next week, of, week evaluating each of our elders. There's five of us. It should take you 10 to 15 minutes per elder to complete the evaluation. But we want to know how we're doing serving you. And so I'd encourage you to do that this week. This booklet that we've put together, this 44-page booklet, is what we spent the last six months, this plus two more booklets that you'll get over the course of this series, is what we spent the last six months studying. And over the next three weeks, we're going to talk about different leaders that are found in this church. We'll examine, examine the biblical precedents and discuss how they function within our church here. And I want you to know, we've not taken this study lightly. We've read and discussed and disagreed, but ultimately we came to the same conclusion, and that's this. God has called some to lead his church. And while there's grace and liberty in how some of that plays out within specific contexts and places, God is abundantly clear that the character of his leaders is primary. And as a church, we haven't always chosen leaders who understood their identity in Christ we haven't always chosen leaders who had the most godly character. And we haven't always chosen leaders who were committed to their calling. And for that, I'm sorry. But as we look to the future of this church, the elders are more committed than ever to identify, to train, and equip the future leaders of High Hill Christian Church. And as I said we're going to look at some key leadership roles within our church over the next few weeks. Today, we're going to start with the role of elder. The booklet that you have is going to give you far more detail than I can possibly cover today. I'm going to hit the highlights and give you an overview to help you clarify the primary leadership role within this church. In today's Western church culture, elders are often considered optional roles. Some churches have them, some don't. Some churches have one, and some have many. But elders are not an optional church feature. They are central to God's plan for shepherding his church. The word elder is translated from two different Greek words in various verses throughout the New Testament. One of those Greek's word, Greek words is presbyteros, and it's found in 1 Timothy 5, 17 and several other places, and it's translated in your Bible as the word elder. The second Greek word used in the New Testament is the Greek word episkopos, which is a word translated as overseer in 1 Timothy chapter 3. 
And it means an overseer or a supervisor, a ruler, whose primary task refers to the supervising function exercised by an elder within a local congregation. Almost all New Testament authors address the role of elders in some way, and with an essential role like this in the church, defining who is qualified to be an elder is essential. In every passage about elders, Scripture compares the role of leading the church to leading a family. And just as God has called men to lead in marriage and parenting, he also calls men to lead the church family as well. God has called men, and only men, to be church elders. Now there are two important notes that I would like to make at this moment. The first is this. God has gifted and called many women to lead and serve the church in many different ways. Biblically, God has called the office of elders to only be filled by qualified men. Two, many equate the terms pastor and elder as synonymous. We'll talk about that more in a few weeks, but the role of elder and the role of pastor are not the same. They are similar. They have similar qualifications. They have similar duties, but they are different. All elders pastor or shepherd the churches they serve, but not all pastors are elders. In 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, Paul lays out the blueprint for the role of elders within a local church. <clears throat> he says this, this saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must be or not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil. We find a similar list of qualifications spelled out in Titus 1, 5 through 9. When we are instructed to appoint elders in every town as I directed you, if anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination, for an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy, trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Again, in 1 Peter 5, 2 through 9, we find Peter saying, The shepherd of the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you shall receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded and watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone whom he may devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. From these passages, we found four qualifying traits that all elders or potential elders must possess. These traits serve as an overarching category for several traits, skills, and expectation of elders. They are desire, character, doctrine, and family. These four areas of an elder or a potential elder's life must be examined 
to determine if they qualify to serve at the highest level of leadership within this church. We spelled them out in much greater detail in your booklet for you to read this week. But desire is the first qualifying trait. Being a faithful elder demands a lot of you. So you have to want to serve in that role. An elder must serve with eagerness, enthusiasm, and cheerfulness in their role. They shouldn't seek eldership for personal ambition, power, or honor, but rather as a calling from the Holy Spirit. The second qualifying trait is the character of an elder. Your character is far more important than your skills when it comes to being an elder. Holy character is emphasized throughout the New Testament because elders, as leaders of the church, must reflect the character of Christ. In these passages, we find 19 character traits that we have defined for you in greater detail in your booklet. They are this, an elder must be above reproach. An elder must be respectable. An elder must have a good reputation. An elder must not be quarrelsome, not violent. An elder must be devout. An elder must not lord their position over others. An elder must be sensible and prudent. They must be self-disciplined, not greedy. An elder must be an example, not quick-tempered, not, or a lover of what is good. An elder must be temperate, upright, not arrogant, gentle, and hospitable. Elders should also be able to teach the Bible. Teaching the Bible is central to an elder's shepherding work. An elder must have a certain ability to accurately handle the word of truth. This means he is able to show from Scripture right teaching and understanding as the specific needs and questions arise in the normal course of shepherding. Now, this does not necessarily mean an elder is required to have the spiritual gift of teaching. An elder's primary ministry may not be preaching or any other ongoing teaching venue within the local church. But at High Hill Christian Church, we expect all of our elders to preach at least once a year during our Sunday morning worship experiences. Finally, an elder must lead their family well. In fact, marriage and parenting can serve as a proving ground for an elder's fitness. 1 Timothy 3.2 says, An elder must be the husband of one wife. This phrase is better translated as a one-woman man. An elder is to be above reproach in his sexual and marital life. An elder is to be blameless in his interaction with the opposite sex. His intimate affection is focused solely and entirely on his wife. An elder's marriage should be an example of what a godly marriage looks like. Now this does not exclude potential elders who have been widowed or divorced from serving as elders within our church. The crucial assessment about what is or the crucial assessment when evaluating a man's care for his family is the conduct of his children. This means he guides his children as a concerned, responsible father. He's not a harsh tyrant. He's not a bully. Children are not required for a potential elder to serve, but they do give insight into the natural or the nature of an elder's true leadership skills. When Titus 1 6 speaks of children who believe, we take that to mean children who are faithful to the teaching and the discipline of their father. That does not mean that all of an elder's children must be genuine believers, because that's not their responsibility. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. But a man's ability to lead and manage the people of God can be measured by the evidence of having children who are well-behaved. Know that now that we know who is qualified to be an elder, we must look at what elders do here at High Hill Christian Church. Our elders serve the church by focusing on four key areas in their role. Elders are expected to protect the congregation or the flock that they oversee. This, is not, this not only indicates the flock's physical well-being, but more importantly, their spiritual well-being. This protection happens through the study, institution, and preservation of sound doctrine, 
protective policies for the well-being of the flock, and church discipline when necessary. Elders, among other leaders in the church, are called to teach and instruct the flock with sound doctrine. Elders are responsible for meeting the spiritual, emotional, and physical needs of the flock. Scripture calls all believers to share the, care, the burden of care for each other, so our elders have empowered those with pastoral gifts to help provide this care. Elders are responsible for the oversight or the governing of the congregation that they lead. Through policies describing how our church functions, elders exercise the management of staff, resources, and volunteers in order to fulfill the vision God has given them for this local church. These policies release others to execute the ministry of the church under the direction and the leadership of our elders. Our elders are called to a high task, and we hold them to a high standard. And so as we move into our time of response, I thought it might be beneficial for us to spend some time praying over the elders of this church. If you don't know them, I'd like to introduce you to them. We've got Kevin Cobb, so come on up here, and Kent Hall, and Jason Pearson, and Dave Lynch, and myself. Five of us serve as elders here at High Hill Christian Church. And I want you to know, having served with them for almost seven years now, there's no greater group of men I'd rather serve with. These men give of themselves more than you could possibly imagine. Asking them to wake up every Monday at 6 a.m. to be here at a meeting to talk about the health of our church and to pray for our congregation, and then asking them to wake up again at 6 a.m. on Thursday to be here for another meeting so that they can grow in their own faith and study God's Word together. We've been through hell and back. We've experienced incredible joy as we've served this church. We've also experienced incredible heartache. But I know these men have my back. They know everything there is to possibly know about me. They are my closest friends, my greatest companions, and it is an honor to serve with them. If you could calculate the sacrifice that they make for this church, it would be overwhelming to understand the time they give up from their family, the late night calls, the early mornings, the hour-long meetings about things that shouldn't take that long, <laughs> the joy, the friendship that we have with each other. If you were to look at our elder thread, you would see important topics being discussed throughout the week, but you would also find random conspiracy theories, silly gifts, weird pictures of things that we saw while we were out and about in our day. You'll see a group of men who are earnestly desiring to serve this church well, and I am grateful to be one of them. So I've asked Cody to come up and pray over our elders. And if you would like to come up as well, we're going to lay hands on them. And we're going to spend some time praying over them. And I would encourage you over the next several weeks to be praying for these men. Because as I shared a few weeks ago, Satan is active, actively looking for ways to bring division and destruction within our church body and in the lives of our people. And these men are on the front lines. They feel every hit. They feel every loss. When someone comes, they're excited. When someone leaves, they're heartbroken. When someone gives their life to Christ, we know that we've done a good job. When someone is upset or frustrated, we know that we need to do better. 
And so we're going to spend some time praying. I want to invite you. If you want to come up here and lay hands on them or you just want to stretch out your hands, that's fine too. Whatever you would like to do. But we're going to spend some time. I'm going to let Cody pray over each of our elders.